All right, so we are going to continue this unit, this final unit, uh, with herbivores. So we're going to talk about kind of some generalities about feeding herbivores, uh, what are our food sources for them, the pros and cons of all of those things, um, and then we're going to go through a few examples of herbivores. So we'll talk about different categories of herbivores. So essentially they're kind of broken down into their digestive system and um, what type of plants they eat as well. Um, and then we'll go through those food sources, what are their uh, main nutrient uh, requirements for those guys. And then some examples, some things that we, um, the chapters in the book uh, cover our cattle or beef cattle, dairy cattle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about sheep and goats and maybe some uh, special things we need to consider with those guys. Um, and then finally, uh, the horse. So when we talk about herbivores, we're talking about animals that just rely on plants for their main source of nutrients. So they're, they're able to uh, break down the cellulose, those high fiber foods, and um, they use microbes uh, for that process. So somewhere in their GI tract, they're going to have a fermentation vat, you can think of it, um, whether that be their stomach or some other part of their uh, intestines, um, their cecum, their large intestine, um, that is where that fermentation is happening. And the microorganisms are going to anaerobically ferment that fiber, meaning that they're gonna break it down uh, without oxygen. So anaerobically means without oxygen. Um, so they're in um, that vat, so they're, they don't have access to oxygen. So these are going to be um, bacteria and microorganisms that are anaerobic. They don't require oxygen. And so by doing that, um, the microbes help the animal, right? So they're going to create those volatile fatty acids that are going to produce energy for them. They're going to produce um, amino acids. They're going to produce um, vitamins. So uh, a lot of benefits from having microbes in their digestive system. So really, when we talk about feeding herbivores, we're really feeding those microbes because we need that the the health of those microbes are really important to keep the host alive, um, whether that's you know a horse or a cow or a sheep or whatever that may be, your exotic animals that are herbivores, you really are feeding the microbes. So we can further break down herbivores, just kind of general the big picture of herbivores into our foregut fermenters and hindgut fermenters. So we'll talk a little bit more about the differences between those two and what animals fall into those categories. So first we're going to talk about the foregut fermenters. So these guys have that fermentation vat within their stomach. So the stomach is kind of the first part of the digestive system or the foregut. So that's why they're called foregut fermenters. And usually the stomach is going to have more than one chamber. Okay, so, you know, we call, um, we talked a lot about omnivores and carnivores being monogastric, meaning one stomach. So there's a big misconception that, you know, ruminants, especially cows, have four stomachs. Well, that's, that's a misnomer. They don't have four separate stomachs. They have four chambers within their one stomach, and one of those chambers is a rumen. So that's why they're referred to as ruminants. But there are other species out there, some of our exotic species, that are foregut fermenters, but they don't necessarily have all four chambers and they don't have a rumen, which is why they're not considered ruminants. Like camelids, so camels, alpacas, those guys um, have a like three chambers in their stomach, okay? And they do fermentation in there as well. So they are fermenters, they have the microbes in there, but they don't have a rumen. Hippos, uh, kangaroos, wallabies, those guys um, have kind of two 
plus ish chambers in their intestines, um, as well as uh, colubine monkeys and sloths. So those guys don't have as many uh, compartments or chambers, but they do have the microbes and they are doing fermentation. Okay. And I love that sloth picture. I love sloths. So this is just a picture of um, a camelid stomach, just for funsies. Um, so you can kind of see where those compartments are and they have some sacs that are kind of coming off those compartments. So lots of chambers in there, lots of places for fermentation, but they just don't have that rumen. So they're not considered ruminants. So I just, put this as an example, you don't need to know all of these chambers or compartments of the stomach just uh, for a good example. So what are some special things about herbivores, um, specifically for gut fermenters? So these guys, they're fermenting that food in their stomach. Um, and because it's in the beginning of the digestive system, they have some advantages. So they're less sensitive to the amino acid composition of their food because those microbes are able to make a lot of the amino acids. They, they aren't um, as sensitive to all those essential amino acids. So they don't have to have some of those um, essential amino acids. And they can even get um, their nitrogen source instead of from those amino acids from non-protein sources, so such as as ammonia, urea, we talked about some of those non-protein nitrogen sources in um, a previous lecture. So as long as they have, I think it was cobalt, um, they are in some other of those um, minerals, they're able to um, utilize the, the non-protein nitrogen sources. So a big benefit too is those microbes are able to make some vitamins too. So specifically, um, a lot of those B vitamins, which are those water soluble vitamins, as well as vitamin K, which was that uh, fat soluble vitamin uh, responsible in uh, the blood clotting pathway. So those clotting factors uh, that require vitamin K. And another cool thing too, specifically with ruminants, uh, you don't see this in too many of the other foregut fermenters, but ruminants specifically chew their cud. So, you know, you look out into a field of cows or sheep or something like that, and, you know, they're laying there looking all happy in the grass and they're just chewing. And so they are actually regurgitating their food from that rumen um, up into their mouth again so that they can re-chew their food and then they swallow it again. So it just aids in that uh, mechanical digestion uh, to help out those microbes and all that digestion happening and fermentation happening within their stomach. So it's very normal for ruminants. So now let's talk about our hindgut fermenters. So these guys, um, that fermentation is happening in further down in the GI system. So very commonly in the cecum or the large intestine, which we call the colon. Um, so it's not happening in the stomach. So these guys are usually have simple stomachs or are monogastrics, um, and then they have quite complex cecums or colons, and that is where all that fermentation is happening. That's where the microbes live. And they have some disadvantages because of that, because it's so much further down in their GI system. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what are some examples of these hindgut fermenters? So we know our equids, right? Horses, zebras, donkeys, those guys, rhinos as well and elephants, so I don't have pictures of those guys, we know what they look like. Wombats, which are super cute. Rabbits um, are pretty much just miniature horses, really, when you talk about their GI system. Koalas, some rodents, manatees, uh, they're also adorable. And then any sort of herbivorous tortoises, desert tortoises as well. So these guys all are hindgut fermenters. 
So because we said that these hindgut fermenters are at a little bit of a disadvantage because all that fermentation is happening so far down in their digestive system, it doesn't allow for as much um, absorption of the nutrients, the vitamins and um, amino acids that are created by those microbes. So many hindgut fermenters, um, especially when we're talking about some rodents, um, they undergo corporophagy, which essentially they eat their own poop. So that's what coprophagy means is that they, um, they ingest either their own poop or uh, poop of other individuals in their herd or whatever that may be. Um, so this is very common in rabbits. Uh, they'll actually pull the poop right out of their butt and eat it. If you've ever watched it, it's quite hysterical. Uh, hamsters, guinea pigs, hedgehogs, those guys. I know we've talked about, you know, hedgehogs as being insectivores, and but so uh, they do eat veggies as well. So they're a little more omnivorous. Um, young animals. These guys, you definitely see them eating poop, especially horses, elephants, uh, pandas, koalas, even hippos. Um, and they tend to eat their mother's feces or even other, if they're in a herd situation, they will eat other um, herd uh, individuals' feces as well. But it's for a different reason. So these guys are gaining bacteria from their mother's poop. So essentially they're trying to build their own um, gut flora and what better way than to get mom's gut bacteria. So very important in developing the young um, animal's digestive system is to eat their mom's poop. So we can uh, further categorize ungulates, which are just animals with hooves. So most ungulates are herbivores. And essentially they all can have kind of different foraging strategies. And what does that mean? That means, you know, what are they actually, what types of plants are they actually eating? And it does correspond to their digestive morphology. So they uh, do have some differences depending on what types of plants they eat. So when we break them down even further, we can talk about concentrate selectors. And these guys are gonna be the ones eating leaves specifically, uh, fruit and flowers. And these, uh, these concentrate selectors are selecting things that are lower in fiber. So definitely not as much fiber in their diet. Um, and this is in uh, contrast to browsers and grazers. So browsers specifically look for more bulk roughage and that's much higher in fiber. Uh, so we talked about what browse is uh, before and we'll talk a little bit more about it as well, but more uh, woody uh, plant material, right? So a lot higher in fiber, uh, indigestible fiber. Uh, and then we have our intermediate feeders, and these guys are going to kind of take whatever they can get. They, you know, have a mixed diet of browse and forage. Versus our grazers are very specific that they eat just forage, mostly grasses and legumes, and usually low to the ground, right? They're not picking off leaves and sticks from trees and bushes. So just some differences in these categories um, of ungulates. So I just have some pictures to show that. And, you know, here's an example of a concentrate selector is the roe deer. So these guys are gonna be eating those flowers and leaves and they're much more selective on what they eat. Uh, you know, versus a goat, these guys are kind of intermediate feeders. They'll browse, they'll graze, they'll eat just about anything, right? Versus sheep and horses and even cattle are grazers. So they're really just gonna eat the grasses and the legumes um, low to the ground. So now we can get into our food sources for herbivores. And we've talked a lot about, you know, our different hays and forages and roughages in, in a different lecture, but we'll talk about maybe why they're a little specific uh, to herbivores.
So a main staple for many herbivores, especially grazers, are is hay. So this is just a dried forage, high in fiber. But the important thing about hay is um, the curing process. So you, they ha well, we talked about this before as well. It has to dry properly and cure properly in the fields before baling it up. Uh, so because if it's too wet, you know, you get mold, you can get that water leaching. Um, if it's too dry, it's going to decrease the nutrient content. Um, but sun curing can be good and bad, right? So it can increase the vitamin D level levels, but it also can decrease the vitamin A levels. So kind of some pros and cons uh, there with dried forage versus, you know, pasture. Um, the nutrient uh, content really depends on a couple of different things, and we talked a little bit about this before, but, you know, the harvest season, right, definitely, uh, the degree of maturity of the plant, right, if it's the first cutting, second cutting, those types of things definitely uh, will change the nutrient content as well as the geographic location specifically for those trace minerals right so selenium things like that that are going to be in the hay so let's talk a little bit about uh, grass hay versus legume hay and maybe you know what are some differences what are some pros and cons to these um, when we are feeding our herbivores so when we talk about grass hay, it tends to be a little um, higher in fiber um, and it's variable in the carbohydrate level, a um, little lower in protein. And the cereal grains, such as an oat hay, tend to be kind of the highest in carbohydrates. And the lowest carbohydrate grass hay is Bermuda grass, but we um, there are some pros and cons for Bermuda grass hay, especially with horses. It's such a long stem that it can cause certain types of impactions. So Bermuda pellets are really the best when you're looking for a low carb um, grass hay option. Uh, Orchard and Timothy are really common grass hays. They're very, they're similar in their protein and carbohydrate levels, um, and they tend to be quite palatable. Um, you do see three-way hay out there as well, and what that means is that it's a combination of grass hay, usually an oat hay, um, like a cereal grain with two different grass hays. So it could be a combination of any three of these grass hays. So now we'll talk about legume hay in contrast to those grass hays. We really only have two common legume hays, and that's alfalfa and clover, um, mostly white or red clover. We feed alfalfa mostly out here in California, but maybe other parts of the country feed clover hay. You just have to be, we talked about some clover types as being toxic, as having that uh, prisidine alkaloid um, in there for liver toxicity but um, red and white clover are usually the types that are turned into hay. But in general, when we talk about legume hay, it, they tend to have a higher nutrient content in general. So higher protein, higher calcium and magnesium, uh, but lower in fiber. So they're considered a hot feed. They just have higher energy, higher nutrient levels. So it's a great option uh, for many uh, herbivores as a, as a good uh, forage option. So we talked about how do we assess the quality of the hay in that other lecture, but just to kind of go through it again, uh, you want to make sure that the stalks of the grass um, are fairly fine. You know, if it's too, um, too thick, it's too much fiber, not very palatable, not easily digested. Um, and there's, you should be of a lot of leaves on the stalk, right? So leaves are definitely what is higher in nutrients. Um, stems are higher in fiber. So that's kind of why those uh, legume hays um, have a lot more nutrients because they have a lot more leaves in there. 
it should be green. It should kind of smell good, smell sweet, right? These are all things you look for. Uh, dirt is a big one. So dirt is really common in hay. Um, mold, you're looking for anything that shouldn't be there. You know, weeds, foreign objects, uh, sticks you find all the time in hay. So this is definitely a, a way to assess quality. Um, it, the stems should be pliable, meaning you should be able to bend it without it snapping or breaking off. So that means that, you know, it's not too dried out. So you don't want it to be super dried out. You want to have, have it maintain some of the, the nutrients in there. So another good um, food source for herbivores are pelleted feeds. So it's a really consistent source of nutrients. So we talked about the advantages of pellets in our other lecture. You know, animals really prefer pelleted feed and they can't pick and choose the different um, nutrients out of the feed as well. So lots of uh, pros for pelleted feeds. And, you know, we talked about some the, the deficiencies that you can find in hay, specifically some of the vitamin deficiencies. And so this can compensate for that. So you don't see those deficiencies in pelleted feed. They're formulated feeds, so they um, have full nutrition. The one drawback is they're not a high fiber nutrient. Uh, so, you know, you're not going to find as high fiber levels as you do in the haze. So we do see different types of pelleted feeds. You can see complete feeds and concentrate feeds. So what are the differences? So a complete feed is a balanced ration, meaning you should be able to feed just that complete feed and the animal will get all of its required nutrients. It will meet all of the, all of the balanced requirements. Okay, so these are just I have Purina examples just because I'm familiar with um, Purina, but you know, there are so many different complete feeds out there. So a complete feed versus a concentrate feed. So concentrate feed is often referred to as a grain. So this is really a concentrated energy source. It's going to be probably made from a cereal grain or um, like an alfalfa pellet. But these cannot be fed all by themselves. They have to be fed with a hay. So it's common to just add concentrate feeds into a diet when you want to add um, energy. So very common for performance or production animals. So browse is also a common food source for especially our browsers or those intermediate feeders. So these woody plant materials such as twigs, shoots, flowers, fruits, um, is a very good source um, of food, but it's really only considered food, you know, quantitatively, if the animal eats it, right? You can put it out there, but you have to take into consideration, you know, the quality, um, the palatability, you know, the animals may not want to eat it. So it really can only count as part of their diet if they eat it. Um, so that's why it really should be science based. You know, you're looking for quality, toxicity, seasonality, right? What's available because it has to be something fresh, right? It's not hay. It's not a dried uh, forage. Um, and you have to take into account the nutritional value of that browse. So lots of things come into play when we talk about browse options. Produce. So we do supplement, um, especially for these, um, you know, non-grazers, uh, the concentrate selectors, we do add in produce. It's, it's a lot higher in sugar and lower in fiber. Uh, and it's really recommended to never feed fruit, but, you know, maybe here and there as, um, you know, rewards or things like that. Um, but it is recommended no more than two to 5% of the diet on a 90% dry matter basis. So the dried weight. So you really want it to be a small portion of the diet. 
Okay, so it's really just probably for enrichment purposes and things like that. So there are things to consider when we're talking about fruits and vegetables and, you know, which ones to consider. You know, we definitely try not to feed the fruit. Uh, but when we're looking at vegetables, you know, spinach and cabbage are commonly fed. But you have to remember that spinach is high in oxalates, which bind calcium. So you can inadvertently cause, you know, a calcium deficiency if you feed too much spinach. Um, cabbage, very interestingly enough, is goitergenic. So remember we talked about uh, goiter development in the thyroid gland. So if we bind the iodine that's required to produce thyroid hormone, that thyroid gland um, essentially just gets hypertrophied and you get a goiter. Uh, and cabbage has uh, stuff in it that binds iodine, so it's considered goitergenic. Endive, which I have on the far right, it's essentially it's um, you know that curly endive. It's like a lettuce that you find. It's a great vegetable option. Good dark green leafy vegetable. And we do talk about fruit. Uh, you got to consider, um, we talked about iron storage disease and um, some animals that might be um, an iron storage disease concern. You, the best choices are blueberries, banana, and peaches. So let's get into some of our herbivore examples. So a lot is written and known about our domestic herbivores. So, you know, a lot of these chapters are very extensive um, in our domestic species because, you know, they are our production animals. So we have to maintain appropriate nutrition for them um, to get the best value out of them. So that is really the main goal, right, of especially, you know, beef and dairy cattle. So when we're talking about beef cattle first, you know, we want to maximize that production efficiency, right? It's, it's a lot of money goes into um, the nutrition of these beef cattle. So your goal is really to maintain an appropriate nutrition for a cow to have a healthy calf and then be able to feed that calf, right? So that is really a great goal uh, for beef cattle. And you have to know that, and we've talked about this before, uh, you know, the daily nutritional requirement definitely increases during pregnancy and it peaks kind of in early lactation. So you have to adjust the nutritional requirements to meet those demands. So when we talk about um, nutrition and why it's important, you know, we want those cows to be healthy and to produce a healthy calf. And why is that important? Because nutrition can really affect uh, postpartum reproduction and birth weight in calves. So what does that mean? That means that when the farmer wants to rebreed that cow after birthing, um, it affects the timing in when they can rebreed that cow. So that's what postpartum reproduction means. They want to rebreed the cow as early as possible. But if um, you know the health and the weight of that cow is not appropriate, then they have to wait um, to rebreed that cow while she regains her weight. And then when we talk about the birth weight of calves, this is really important for replacement heifers. So replacement heifers are going to become those cows that are going to become pregnant and, you know, that they're going to replace the herd essentially. So that's very important to maintain a healthy birth uh, weight for those cows, especially the ones that are going to be uh, heifers. And you can talk about milk production as kind of a an assessment of uh, nutritional health and we'll talk about that a little bit more in dairy cattle but uh, it's hard to assess in beef cattle because you know you leave the calves on the cow so um, they are the ones that are you know in ingesting the milk so it's hard to assess um, milk production 
So now let's talk about dairy cattle. So dairy cows, there's a huge energy demand uh, during lactation of dairy cattle. So you have to adjust and um, compensate for that energy demand. So there's a real um, importance to the right balance of nutrients uh, for dairy cattle. And it's a very complex job. So we're not going to go into all the details of, you know, how do you build um, a balanced nutrition for dairy cattle, the, you know, farmers and there's even computer programs that do that. But essentially, you know, the classic dairy cattle is a Holstein, uh, especially out here, and they can produce up to 40 to 50 kilograms of milk per day. So that's your liter, as you can think of that. Um, even up to 60, I think the world record is 90 kilograms. So that's just a crazy amount of milk per day. And when you talk about their energy requirement for that, um, just the net energy per day is 10 mega calories, which is 10 million calories, lowercase calories, right? So that's a huge amount of energy. And then you have to add almost another millicalorie per kilogram of milk produced. So if you're talking about a cow that's producing you know, 50 kilograms of milk per day, she needs about four times her maintenance requirements. So that's a lot of energy. That's a lot of food. So another thing about, you know, dairy cattle is the calf nutrition. Because you're pulling the calves off the cows, you have to be the person that's going to feed uh, that calf. So the whole goal is to keep them healthy and alive for the first three weeks because the first three weeks of their life, they are the most susceptible um, to disease because of their immune system. So calves, so cows and horses, um, have what's called passive immunity, meaning they rely on their mother for their immunity. So they're not born with their own immune system, essentially. So they require what's called colostrum. And colostrum is the first milk that's produced by the cow or the horse, whatever that may be. Um, many animals require colostrum because the colostrum contains immunoglobulins. Okay, so the immunoglobulins think antibodies, right? So you're going to have antibodies against the different bacteria and things like that. So they actually require three liters within one hour of being born. So whether that's from their own mom or from another cow. Um, it's best from a multi parous cow, meaning it, they've had multiple pregnancies because they've, they're able to build up good colostrum. Usually, um, you know, first time, cat, ma first time pregnancies, they have a hard time building the appropriate colostrum. Um, but it is not only essential for the immunoglobulins, it's essential for multiple nutrients and even growth factors. So if you look at the little graph here, which I really uh, like this graph because it shows that, you know, the 21 days, the first three weeks is the most important. So within that first day, they have to get that colostrum to gain what's called passive immunity, to gain those antibodies from their mom or another cow. It doesn't have to be their mom, but if they were if they were on their mom and were nursing, then they would get the colostrum from her. But since in the dairy cattle world, they're being taken off their mom, then you have to provide that colostrum. And so there is a droop, there is a drop in this passive immunity while the, the baby cow is producing its own antibodies. 
okay? So once it produces its own antibodies, then its immune system is safe, right? They're able to fight off um, infection. But there's this really unsure window right in the middle where the passive immunity is going away and the active immunity or their own immunity, it hasn't quite built up yet. And so that is kind of that really risky period for um, calves, foals, a lot of these young animals. So another thing to consider about calves, even though cows are ruminants, um, functionally young calves are non-ruminants. They they work, their stomach works more like a non-ruminant because their rumen hasn't fully developed yet. So they really require um, easily digestible carbs so they can't break down any fiber yet. So they can't eat the same diet as mom. They need protein and fat. And usually, I mean, they would be drinking their mom's milk. So in dairy cattle, you have usually a milk replacer. It's a lot cheaper uh, than using real milk. So they feed um, the milk replacer on a 1% body weight on dry matter basis. So it's a powder and they have to reconstitute it. So they do it on a dry matter basis. And the problem a lot with this milk replacer, uh, just in general in young animals, is diarrhea. So they call it scours, is kind of another term for diarrhea, um, is very common. So they lose a lot of electrolytes if they do develop diarrhea. So uh, you have to really consider that and um, providing electrolytes during this time period. And usually the rumen will develop by about six months of age, but they can try to encourage the um, development or stimulate the development by feeding, you know, grain and hay. And they have found, you would think hay would stimulate it more, but they have found that actually grain uh, does stimulate rumen development a little bit better than hay. So a lot of times you see, um, you know, cows being fed uh, grain as well, calves being fed grain. So now once um, you know these calves get a little bit older, they a lot of them become heifers. So if they're if they're female, they are maybe going to replace the cows, right, in the in the production process. So it's really important these replacement heifers or just heifers in general, you know. At some point, they're going to be at uh, breeding uh, weight. So they are bred according to weight and not according to age. So, you know, you may think, okay, let's feed the heifer as much as possible so it gains weight really fast, so that way they can breed it sooner, and then, you know, your production is gonna increase. But you have to be careful with the nutrient management because if they gain weight too fast and they don't allow um, the, the mammary glands to develop, then you're not going to get the uh, production, the milk production like you would um, if you were to um, ha allow the heifer to gain weight um, more normally or more appropriately. So there is a huge balancing uh, game happening here with, you know, increased weight development, um, increased weight gain and mammary development. So when we talk about feeding management just of cattle in general, um, you are usually feeding them in groups, right? So you have to base your amount of feed on something. So it's not necessarily any individual. So you want to base it on animals within the 50th to 90th percentile kind of based on weight, right? Because you know, you don't want to feed according to the skinniest cows and you don't want to feed according to the fattest cows because then you're going to over and under feed the rest of them, right? So the 50th to 90th percentile seems to be the best range um, to focus your feeding group. 
And you should have several feeding groups if it allows for it, right? Because cows are going to be in different production groups. And the biggest thing too that's very important uh, in group feeding is the density of the group, right? So if you have too many cows in one area, the access to the feed and especially water is going to be limited. So you want free access to the feed and the water and that is highly dependent on the density. And then another thing that they take into account um, are lights. So uh, if you uh, increase the lights in a barn, and you can really only do this in a barn, right, is that if you turn on the lights for a longer amount of time, you're going to increase the daylight and the photo period, which is going to increase the amount of food they eat because they really only eat during the day. And that in turn increases the milk production. So that's a trick they use. So a goal of a well-managed uh, feeding program is that the diet that the, the animal is consuming is as close as possible to the diet that you formulated, because that's the goal, right? You want a balanced diet, but if they're not eating what you thought or what you planned for them to eat, then uh, what's the point, right? So this is important in the practice, right? So your, your feed has to be appropriately measured. Um, you can test the feed, right? Does it have what it, say, what it says it has in it? Um, is it appropriately mixed um, or assessed, right? So all of these things are very important in the feeding process and management. And the, like we talked about earlier, you're really feeding the microorganisms. So it's important to keep a consistency within that uh, microbe eco ecosystem within the rumen, right? So you want to keep the microbes happy. And if you, there's a lot of things that can disrupt the ecosystem of a rumen or of that, the microflora. So the best thing to do is keep frequent meals throughout the day small frequent meals throughout the day so they are seeing food all the time um, they're not getting big spikes in you know grain or they're not getting these huge meals so oftentimes um, they're always going to have food in front of them in front of the cow so they're always going to be having that option of eating all day long okay and you do get some waste uh, some feed waste with this, you know, with feeding them all day long, but at the same time, you're maxing out uh, the efficiency. So what happens if you want to change a diet, right? You maybe want to increase uh, weight gain or decrease weight gain, whatever that may be. How do you know that your new diet is working? And it's a, it's a challenge. So there are a couple things that, you know, people can do. You can look for metabolic problems, right? So we've talked about a whole slew of different metabolic problems. Um, and so you're obviously going to monitor for those symptoms uh, in animals. Milk yield can be used. Um, and it is a challenge, though, to use the milk yield as an assessment for diet change. But it is one practice that can be used, but it's not immediate, right? So it's not going to be an immediate change. Uh, body condition scores is another way to look at the health of the animal. Know how fat the animal is. Is it too thin? Is it too fat? Um, but again, it's not really an immediate response, right? So there are a lot of computer software programs out there, and I and I don't pretend to know any about anything about them. Um, but you know, the take-home message um, that you know it says in the textbook and just common sense is that you know any of these things really can't compare to really good hands-on experience. You know, somebody that really knows the behavior and the appearance of you know cows. Like, are they how? How are they doing right so pros and cons for everything 
So let's look a little bit closer at some body condition scores. So this is a common um, use for how to assess, you know, health in animals. So especially when you're modifying diets, right? Or is, do you want the animal to gain or lose weight, right? And you want to know where they started out and where they want to end up. So usually, especially in America and European is a little bit different. Um, we, use, we usually use a one through nine number scheme. So one being on the emaciated, severe, uh, severely thin side, and then nine being on the severely overconditioned, obese side. So this picture that I have is a one to five, um, you know, scale, but over here we use one to nine. It, it just gives it allows for a little bit more play uh, in the in the scoring, but either way works. And essentially, the biggest thing is you're looking for uh, fat deposition. So all species are a little bit different on where they store their fat um, on their body. So. Uh, these body condition score tables are going to show kind of where uh, that animal stores fat. So, you know, a big one for cattle is fat storage, you know, around the tail. Okay. So, and along the back, along the, um, you know, the backbones, the spine. So, again, every species is a little bit different, but again, also at the same time it's I to me it's very intuitive right so you should be able to kind of look at an animal and know if it's thin or fat but then again you know we're having a huge issue with obese you know dogs and cats just like in humans so um, maybe we can't tell if we're fat <laughs> I don't know so here's just a you know an example in cattle um, our body condition range. So one being, you know, too thin and then nine being too fat and ideal would probably be five. You know, five and six are probably in the green zone and then you're on the little too thin, a little too fat side and then way too thin or way too fat, right? So we can use body condition scores in non-domestic species as well. We haven't developed them as thoroughly. Um, so what do you usually do? Well, you're gonna do a visual um, assessment, right? What do they look like? Can you see ribs? Can you see bones? Can you see hip bones? Um, if you're able to weigh them, you know, you usually track their weight and that way you have a measurable um, increase or decrease in weight change. Um, if you're able to palpate, if possible, you know, can you feel the ribs? Can you feel things? Um, and knowing what is normal, right? What does a normal elephant look like? But this is one of the few um, non-domestic species body condition score I could find out there. So. so now we're going to talk a little bit about goats and sheep. So a little bit more about goats and a little bit about sheep. So there are really a lot of commercially available grain mixes out there. Um, goats will pretty much eat just about everything. That's kind of their what they're known for. So there's a large variety of feedstuffs. So there's not really, uh, you know, one most appropriate feed for goats. Uh, goats will consume a lot of things that cattle and sheep won't eat. So they're really good um, at, you know, mixed grazing. So uh, they'll complement a lot of other species very well in the grazing world. I mean, you've even seen, you know, goat uh, weed eaters out there. You can rent herds of goats to, you know, take down weeds on hillsides and things. And they just are not as picky as many other uh, species. 
So when we talk about, you know, feeding goats and sheep even, uh, grazing is fairly important. Uh, they should be able to get all of their nutrients from grazing. You know, good pasture, they should be able to get all their nutrients. And you really only consider supplements um, in confinement, right? Because they're, they're not going to get all of the nutrients, all the especially vitamins and minerals um, from the hay. So there are some nutritional and metabolic disorders that uh, you see specifically in goats, and we'll talk a little bit about sheep as well, but these are very specific to goats. Um, in male goats, uh, it's very common to see urinary calculi. So um, especially domestic, like backyard, um, pet goats, um, because a lot of people feed a lot of alfalfa. So, you know, they're feeding their horses alfalfa and they feed their goats alfalfa as well, which is really high in calcium and magnesium. And so that can lead to uh, urinary stones. And the problem with urinary stones in the male urinary tract is they get stuck in the urethra. And so this is a classic pose um, of a male goat straining to urinate on the left. Uh, so very classic pose, very common disorder and quite devastating because the treatment is not, there's not a lot of uh, great treatment options out there without surgery. A lot of people don't want to spend money um, on their goat, right? They just got it as a pet for their horse or, you know, whatever that may be. So it's a challenge and I've seen a lot of it out there. Um, enterotoxemia is another one that goats tend to get. Um, there is a vaccine against it because it's a very specific uh, bacterium, uh, Clostridium perfringens type D, and so they do have a vaccine against it. So that's just a picture of um, somebody giving a goat vaccine. Um, but what happens is they call it the overeating disease, but it it's usually due to high quality like grain diets. You know, they get into a bag of grain, they eat the whole bag, they're gonna get enterotoxemia. So I have seen that as well. Goats tend to eat just about everything and sometimes they shouldn't. So when we're talking about sheep specifically, now sheep, um, you see copper toxicity because sheep are a lot more sensitive to copper than any other species. So copper, and then, you know, when you talk about copper, copper and selenium, you know, they have kind of a narrow range of toxicity, um, so, or a narrow range of safety, I should say. And so copper is added to a lot of feeds at fairly high levels to, you know, beef, um, dairy cattle, horse, and swine feeds. So lots of these have added copper in it. And if you feed that to a sheep, um, you will get toxicity and death even. And there aren't a lot of treat good treatments out there uh, for copper toxicity. And the liver is what is mostly affected. So when you get any sort of liver disease, um, an animal becomes icteric. Uh, jaundice is a human term. Uh, for increased bilirubin and the bilirubin is yellow and so it goes into the tissues the mucous membrane tissues and you can see that yellowing um, like in this picture in the in the conjunctiva of the eye so in different mucous membranes they turn yellow and that's what's called jaundice for humans or icteric for animals So now let's talk a bit about horses. So of course, horses are my favorite and I know the most about them, but let's talk a little bit about what's important about them. So they are hindgut fermenters and they're not the best hindgut fermenters, um, but in any case, 
they definitely do not utilize fiber as efficiently as cattle. And we talked about just the gen as in general, hindgut fermenters um, don't utilize nutrients as well as foregut fermenters because the bacteria, even though they're doing a great job in there, they produce the protein, those amino acids and vitamins. It's they, they just don't have enough time to utilize and absorb what is being produced by the microbes. So that's just kind of a general terminology or general problem with hindgut fermenters. And uh, horses should be grazing animals, right? If you see horses in the wild, they are grazers. So they eat, they should be eating small meals a day, you know, a little grazing, a little moving. And this helps to not disrupt that microflora in their GI system. And the thing about horses is they are very sensitive to GI disturbances. So any sort of high energy, low forage diets definitely adversely affect um, the microbial um, flora, the activity of the bacteria. So, and guess what we do with horses, right? So we feed them, you know, two large meals a day, maybe three if they're lucky. And so we are definitely decreasing the microbial activity of their GI system, which sets them up for GI disturbance. So horses just in general um, have a lot more individuality when it comes to their nutrient requirements. So unlike other livestock like cattle that we've been talking about, horses were really not selected for feed efficiency. They were selected mostly for their athletic abilities, right? So especially nowadays, we are selecting them for the best race horses, the best dressage horses, the best jumping horses. Um, you know, this is American Pharaoh and Velagro, two of my favorite horses. But anyways, they're, they were not selected for feed efficiency, that's for darn sure. So they were selected for other things. And there can be as much of 20% difference in their, are in their maintenance requirements. So, you know, when you feed one horse, that's not going to work for another horse. So they're very individual when it comes to their feed um, requirements. And so we rely very heavily on body condition score, right? So, you know, some horses can live on air and be fat and some require so much food, you'd think they would burst, right? And they're still skinny. So everybody, all horses are a little bit different. So here's just one uh, body condition scoring chart for horses. There are a lot of them out there because it is so important um, for you know horse maintenance. So again, you're looking for that ideal five uh, score out of nine. And everything under is a little too thin uh, to greatly thin uh, or you know too fat to obese. So horses definitely can be maintained on a good quality forage. So when we talk about good quality forage, you know, pasture, good quality pasture is really the ideal because it's the closest thing to their natural environment as you can get. You know, same with a lot of these other herbivores, especially grazers. So if you have a good quality pasture, you're getting much higher levels of antioxidants such as vitamin E and carotene because the hay just is not going to have those levels. Uh, pasture reduces a lot of problems as well that we see in domestic horses. Um, it definitely lowers the incidence of colic, uh, gastric ulcers, uh, lots of respiratory disease that are due to, you know, dust and mold, um, as well as abnormal behaviors. You see a lot of stereotypic behaviors in horses. I'm sure you guys um, know all about stereotypic behaviors in animals, you know, when you're talking about um, captivity and captive animals. So what are some forage alternatives? 
So we do see these being used if you don't, if you don't have access to good forage. Uh, beet pulp has become a lot more popular in the equine world. Um, it's more common than the other ones, but it is deficient in some vitamins and minerals. So you really have to take that under consideration if you're using it as a pure forage alternative. What a lot of people do is they add beet pulp um, to diets, um, to forage diets. So, um, and the thing with beet pulp is, and here's a picture of beet pulp, there is pelleted version uh, and shredded versions, but you do have to soak beet pulp before you feed it because it can swell uh, in their stomach if you don't uh, soak it ahead of time. So there is a risk uh, to beet pulp if you don't know that you have to soak it first. So other common feeds for horses are grains and commercial mixtures. So these are, you know, things that are going to all add energy. Oats are a very common horse feed um, because it's they're highly palatable. Horses love them. And they're very digestible, especially in the small intestine. So that means that they don't have to really undergo a lot of fermentation in the cecum and colon so they get a lot of energy out of it right away and don't you know add extra strain uh, to the fermentation process uh, but there are a lot of commercial grain mixtures out there whether it be textured pelleted extruded we've talked a lot about pelleted um, extruded you're adding steam so it's less dense uh, you're adding volume so it could be uh, good if you're not trying to add, you know, too much energy. Uh, there are other options as well out there, like rice bran. I didn't put on here, but that's high fat. So these are kind of, um, you know, cereal grains are a lot more carbohydrates than fat. So when we talk about vitamins and minerals with horses, um, a big one that has gotten a lot of attention lately, both in humans and in animals, is vitamin E. Um, because we've seen a deficiency in vitamin E in hay, um, that leads to kind of a deficiency overall in the animal as well. And so we have linked a couple of these neurological diseases uh, in horses, such as equine motor neuron disease and equine degenerative myeloencephalopathy. So you don't need to know too much about, you know, the, the diseases or disorders in any way, but know they are neurological. And the big thing about vitamin E is it's an antioxidant. So a lot of these disorders have either been prevented or significantly improved with high levels of supplementation of vitamin E. So the, the picture is an equine motor neuron disease horse. They look like they're standing on um, a ball. So their motor neurons um, have a problem. So they can't talk to their muscles very well. Um, degenerative myeloencephalopathy has to do with um, the central nervous system. So both neurological disorders, but uh, kind of different processes for both. But the big thing is that um, it, you see a lot of improvement. It's been associated with vitamin E deficiency and treatment with vitamin E greatly improves them. So another thing we see with not only horses, but also cattle, goats and sheep kind of in general is uh, creep feeding. So what creep feeding is, is it's a method of supplementing a young animal, a young livestock, whether that be a calf or a foal or a lamb um, or a kid, you're able to offer food to those animals who are still nursing without mom or the adults being able to eat their food. So it's, there are a lot of creep feeding options or creep feeders, but essentially the whole point is that the smaller animal has access to the feed and the larger animal does not.
Okay, so it's a way to selectively um, feed or supplement these uh, usually young animals, but it can be used for companion grazing animals such as goats or sheep, you know, feed them something instead of the horse or the cow, the larger animals. So these are just a couple examples I found online, but um, essentially, you know, the calf can go in there and eat or the kid can go in there and eat. Um, the one in the middle is a bucket for a foal, so the mom can't get to it, but you can supplement um, the foal. So another thing we have to consider about feeding young horses or definitely weanlings is um, the problem with uh, increased growth. So they grow too fast, you feed them too much, and they get these developmental orthopedic diseases. So it's kind of a general term for a couple of these different developmental conditions. And they, there's a lot of research being done with these uh, disorders. Um, a lot of them have to do with growth, but um, some are associated with copper deficiency. Um, so a lot of other things that have to do with it, not just nutrition, um, could be genetics as well. But a big thing is appropriate calcium phosphorus ratios, and that's really important for any growing animal. But uh, there's just some examples down here. Osteochondrosis or OCD means there is little um, fragments uh, in the joint. So the joint doesn't form. A lot of things, a lot of these have to do with the joint, right? So the epiphyseal plates or the growth plates. Um, flexural deformities, meaning um, the, the leg isn't straight, right? So it bends incorrectly, like the first picture, it kind of, their legs bend outwards, okay? So they're not perfectly straight. Um, epiphysitis, so inflammation in those growth plates, the epiphyseal plates, so that's this picture. You can see the bulging up at the epiphyseal plate, same with this picture on the end too, in the just two different joints, knee joint in the first picture, uh, fetlock joint in the other picture. Um, and this is also a flexural deformity. See, it's up on its toe, so it can't, uh, the tendons aren't releasing uh, there as well. So just lots of different, dis, you know, developmental disorders um, when you don't take, you know, appropriate nutrition into account. But a lot of it has to do with overnutrition um, as well. So you can't quite pin it on any one thing. So something to consider, and we've talked a little bit about it, but especially with horses and horse management, uh, Water is really the most important nutrient that you cannot forget about. And um, horses are really sensitive to any slight deficiency in water. So their requirement really varies according to environment, um, the dry matter intake, and nutrient contents of the diet. So just as a general rule, they require, you know, two to three liters of water per kilogram of dry matter feed. And we've kind of talked about um, this range a little bit um, before, right? So very specific though to horses here. And even a slight deficiency in water can cause a decrease and food intake because for horses and a lot of other animals um, you know eating and drinking go hand in hand if they're not doing one they're not doing the other so if they decrease their water intake or their food food intake they're gonna decrease the other one as well and that can cause a huge problem you know they're definitely going to um, have some GI disturbance associated with that you know, you can talk about, um, you know, water affecting the GI, but also fiber content when we're talking about herbivores. So if you have too much water, they're going to get diarrhea. If they have not enough water, they're going to get impactions um, and vice versa. If they don't have enough fiber, they're going to get diarrhea. If they have too much fiber, they're going to get impactions. So, you know, it's a little bit inversely related with fiber and water. Okay. So, 
this is just a picture of the intestinal tract of a horse, right? And where these impactions tend to happen um, is in the large colon, surprise, surprise, because that's where all that fermentation is happening. You know, that's in the large colon, you're taking water out of the digesta, so it's getting to be dried out feces. Um, but it, there's also a lot of twists and turns in this GI tract. So it's, you know, there's lots of these har hairpin turns and that's a common place for an impaction. It's called this pelvic flexure uh, in the colon. So that's a very common spot for impaction. And then this is just a horse down, you know, common signs of colic or GI disturbance are laying down, rolling, looking at their sides, stretching out, all those classic signs of GI disturbance or colic, we call it. So just a little bit, you know, to finish off kind of how to feed the older horse. So we have a lot of older horses or senior horses, we call them kind of anyone in over 20 years of age is considered a senior horse. And it doesn't mean that all 20 year horses, um, all senior horses are going to have difficulty um, you know, with their diet. But in general, at about 20 is when their teeth start to wear down or become smooth. So that means that the grinding surface of their tooth um, is less efficient. So it becomes smooth. So they can't grind all that fiber. And so when they can't grind all that fiber, then they're going to pass that through their digestive system and increase the uh, chance of impaction or colic. So, you know, if that happens, and that's why dentistry is so important in horses and why you should have the vet check their teeth, you know, every year to be able to see if they have any of these changes. Um, and then you can switch them to a more pelleted complete feed. And luckily there are a lot of senior feeds out there for these senior horses. And they have higher protein contents and higher minerals and vitamins. And they have lower fiber levels. So they're able to digest them a lot more easily. So this is just a picture I have here of the horse teeth. So, you know, these cheek teeth, these premolars and molars are really important as that grinding surface. All of these herbivores have have to have, you know, teeth that are able to grind these um, high fiber feeds. So we're going to finish off um, the rest of this unit and class with, I'm going to switch up the two uh, weeks. So we're going to do zoo nutrition first. Uh, that'll be next week. And then I'm going to finish off with diet formulation at the end, okay, um, for the next week. So these are our last two um, lectures for the class. And I hope everyone is staying safe and enjoying the sunshine.